100 years before Rolleston and just outside Christchurch was designated the town of the future, there was another township on the drawing board. 30 kilometres as the magpie flies down the road from Rolleston. It was to be a model town bordering the South Island's Rakai River, located in the shadow of the mountains of the Canterbury Plains. Countryside farming community, English village style. It will be as self-sufficient as possible in the mid-1870s, yet only a hop, skip and train trip to the city of Christchurch. A township of the righteous, as long as you weren't Catholic that is, socialists also weren't entirely welcome. And you can still visit the place, well, what's left of it today. As a bit of background, before I became poor, had kids, the wife and I went around the South Island looking at ghost towns, staying in pubs, Danzy's Pass, etc. Took crappy photos, which somehow, when scanned, now look cool. Trust me, it wasn't deliberate. This road trip at the end of 89 coincided with the publication of the book New Zealand Ghost Towns by prodigious Kiwi writer Gordon L. Any book by Gordon L. is an A. The closest ghost town in his book was only 75 kilometres from our doorstep, Bar Hill. The story behind the town is fascinating and boils down to a tall, charismatic Scotsman who named his village after a similar one on the west coast of Scotland. John Cathcart Wazen was an overachiever par excellence in no particular order. He was a local member of parliament in both Selwyn and Coleridge as well as Orkney and Shetlands back in Scotland. He would regularly skirt back and forth to the UK. A local council member in Ashburton on more than one stint. He's the president of the Ashburton Racing Club. President of the Rakaia Rugby Club. And by the way, he was schooled at rugby back in the UK. On the committee of both the Rakaia Swimming and Cricket Clubs, he was an honorary member of the Ashburton Golf Club. In Parliament, he bemoaned the country's borrow and hope policies campaigned for education to be secular, made sure his constituents didn't end up being lumbered with the proposed grain tax. Inexorable, he got into more than one quarrel. In this slinging match with a fire and brimstone, a prohibitionist, for example. He was on the good guy's side, by the way. Took a case against the public trust got booted off the local road board after the other councillors had a guts full of his pig-headedness. That roading board, by the way, was the one that oversaw the construction of the Rakai Bridge. If this doesn't already sound enough public service to keep one busy enough, he was also a hand-on owner of a large working farm, director of North Canterbury Farmers Cooperative, and at one point on the school board of Ashburton High School, despite never having children. Take a mental note at this juncture to never put your hand up at meetings. And through all of this, he and his wife Alice were also players on the Christchurch social scene. This everywhere but nowhere attitude would partly doom his pet project. Now time for a quick advert break. Let's open my vault door and try and tempt you with some more goodies. The US consulate bombing in 1975 in Christchurch. Bet you didn't know about that. Harry McNish, polar explorer and his cat Chippy are the number one grave to visit at the Kaori Cemetery. And this is one about when the mayor of Whanganui shot an itinerant poet. Onwards! That pet project sprung out of his landholding called Korwa. Korwa was named after his family estate back in Scotland. A farm he purchased a year after arriving in New Zealand in 1869. Previously the 20,000 acre wheat and sheep farm was called Linden. By the mid 1870s when this idea sprung into his head, Korwa had been whittled down to approximately 5,000 acres wasn't decided he needed company closer than the 17 kilometres to the nearest township in Rakaia 
in possession of the money and drive, he simply create his own township on his farm, Bar Hill. Trees were planted, oaks, walnuts, poplars. The picturesque tree line entrance to the town is still there today. Oh yeah, I probably haven't mentioned this. Wazen was the vice president of the local acclimatisation society was amongst the first people in the country to plant pines as shelter belts and looked at the pines as a great source of timber. He set up his own sawmill for that task. Each variety of the trees planted would coincide with the street named accordingly. 28 leased sections in the initial township were designated. We'd call it stage 1 today. More were planned as soon as the new railway line would go through town. By 1878, there was a church, a bakery, a blacksmith, store, school, post office and a mini meatworks. And 15 sections were occupied. Of those, just the ones built out of concrete survive today. The Anglican church is staring back at you. The school, which is now a hall. The school house to house the teachers, that's still there. And another one of the building that survived this era and his tenure, a Wazen special, is just down the track on his old farm, a Kowa, the Kowa Homestead Lodge, now a part-time time capsule. Originally a gatekeeper's lodge to police people who came and went, that later on would become a house until about the Second World War. And sadly, all the timber-built cottages have gone bye-bye. Wazen's original homestead, come mansion, burnt down in 1902. Pity I couldn't come up with a photo of that. The place was huge. 20 rooms. By the time the fire happened, Wazen had been back in the UK for two years. So what happened to the township of Barhill? Why didn't it go ahead? I think it boils down to three main things. One, the number of balls Wazen was juggling. Farmers are generally hands-on folk who get up at Sparrow Fart. I've already told you about all the committees he was on. There were only so many hours in the day. And then there was a time away up in Parliament. Time in Wellington he doubtless looked forward to so he could get a decent lion. Social functions to attend. One amusing anecdote from those events was when he intervened in an altercation using his bulk to lift one of the protagonists up and plonk him amongst the desserts on the table. Trifle was mentioned as one of those. Wazen was certainly not what you would term, though, a man-manager. It was his way or the highway. This letter to the press he wrote after losing a by-election. Take a sec to read it. Second major reason why Bar Hill never blossomed was the aforementioned railway line. Indeed, the Meffron branch was established, just not there. His hopes of a regional passenger and freight hub were dashed. Then, of course, cars ultimately came along after the turn of the century. The main highway was a trifling 17 kilometres down the road then. In terms of location, the village was largely back to square one from the advent of the vehicle. At its peak, there were 75 people living in Bar Hill. That population gradually dropped, or more correctly, drifted away to bigger smokes where the jobs were. That's because of our third reason. The global Long Depression hit the country at the very same time the finishing touches were being made to the township, meaning it lasted only two decades. These were, after all, leased properties. Once the lease period was up, folks up sticks and left by the mid-1890s it was terminal. There was however support for the infrastructure created that came from the local farming community. It saw the Bar Hill Post Office not closed till 1925 and the Bar Hill School didn't close till 1938. Wasn't always had one eye on his home country. He sold up and moved back there in 1900. When he sold his farm, it also included a township with it. He became a lawyer and is mentioned MP in a second country. 
dying in London in 1921, making him 72. Out of all his pet projects in the 32 years he spent in New Zealand, Bar Hill has tested time. You can still see the trees he planted there today. This is one of those what ifs. I have a little doubt that if it wasn't, had to throw in the majority of his vast energies into getting Bar Hill established and the railway line had to run through town, it wouldn't be a ghost town today. And the ghost towns are your thing. Take a look at the video I did on the Chinese mining town called Canton that's down in Southland. I hope you enjoyed this one and I've given you a few tempters in the middle here and I'll spot you next time. Bye for now.